today. We're going to talk about how our dominant logic, our way of thinking, gets in the way of our ability to innovate. Now, I want to start with a personal story. In the early 1980s, I get a call from Steve Jobs, nice person to get a call from. And he said, I'm going to do a project where I'm trying to teach people how to read, people who are illiterate, by using computer technology. And this is when the disks were big and the computers were big as well. And so we did a project and it was a lot of places around the United States and included Los Angeles and Detroit and a whole bunch of other places. And when we got done with the first iteration, because we thought the problem was these people did not have access to technology, what we noticed in terms of their illiteracy rates is they didn't go down, they actually went up. We spent all the money in technology and we didn't solve illiteracy. So about 1990, when I first became a professor at Michigan, got a call from Life Magazine. And this was at Life Magazine when um, they were about to go out of business. So they were doing an issue on the 100th, uh, 100th most, most important people of the 20th century. And the woman called me and she said, I want to talk to you about innovation. I felt pretty good about it. And she said, I want to talk to you about, about uh, Robert Fair de Graff. And I said, you're kidding me, I'm a de Graff. And she said, yeah, I want to talk to you about your great uncle. Now, truth be told, my father didn't get along with his father. I didn't know anything about this side of the family, nothing. So I had no idea that somebody on this side of the family actually did something. Well, it turns out he was the man that invented paperback books. He created a company called Pocket Books. Um, interestingly enough, when he passed away, somebody in the family sent me a biography that had been written about him called Two-Bit Culture. And in the biography, what he talks about is he spent his whole life creating this whole idea to make books accessible to every one of you at train stations for two bits, for 25 cents. And his thought was it would correct what? Illiteracy. He thought he'd get over illiteracy with a technology, just like I did. Interestingly enough, about 10 years after that, I was talking to a friend. I was in a vacation in Florida. And a friend said, I'm doing this amazing thing in Kalamazoo, my hometown. We've got a, a, an organization, we've got a family that's got a billion dollars. They're going to raise a sinking fund so that everybody who graduates from high school in Kalamazoo, and this is a fact, it's a fact to this day, will go to college for free. Right? It's the way us Dutch people do things. Right? It's a very sort of Dutch view of the world. Interestingly enough, the Kalamazoo Promise went on for 10 years, a billion dollars, sending everybody to college. And the object was it was going to shrink the achievement gap, the difference between the people who are the top people and the people who are struggling on the bottom. Guess what we learned from the study when we were done the first 10 years? Did the achievement gap, gap go down? No, it got bigger. Here's the point. You believe technology and strategy and process will solve everything. It won't. You have to think differently. If you don't think differently, the money is ill-spent. Now, what I want to talk about is a very important thing to every airman here. I want to tell you that the future has come and gone, and you missed it. Yeah, I want to talk about what kind of mindset we're going to have to have, a creative mindset, in this new world of work. So many things that you think are going to happen someday, what I'm going to point out is a bunch of facts. And I'm going to point out in these facts that these things aren't going to happen. Actually, they've happened. You're looking in the rearview mirror. 